fine. Right, feet up. Roman military boots. Colour guy. Look like a sandal, but they are a boot. Um, very cut away. Allows for aeration of the feet and drainage. They are warm, believe it or not. Even if you can walk through puddles, within a couple of minutes your feet dry them out. Hobnailed, studded. Yeah. Rough country, as there were no roads in Britain before the Romans uh, built them. Yeah. I've got foot wraps on, it's just for a bit of warmth, a bit of comfort, all is a strip of wool, just wrap around your feet. I've got lower leg bindings, this also helps keep your legs warm, and also if you're marching through brush or anything like that, it saves your shins. Yeah. Moving up, you've got the tunic that I'm wearing, Roman tunic. It's a standard bleach colour, this idea that everything was red, or something like that. Bit of a Hollywood myth, really. Um, if you've got loads of red material, it costs a lot to dye it all. So, normal unbleached, um, undyed linen, heavy cotton, or wool tunics were worn. A legionary would get through several of these in one year. Same with the boots. The boots, I reckon, would last about three months because they lived, lived in them. Um, moving on to the body armor. Underneath the body armor I'm wearing is a padded jacket. All armor requires padding underneath. That's to absorb the trauma impact of anything hitting you. Hence why I've got 1980s shoulders. You can see the old shoulder pads from the 80s. It's got a doubler, it's a, it's a Lorica Hamata, a male shirt. It's got a doubling on top for extra strength for any downward blows yep. I encounter from the enemy. It's made of six millimeter rings, riveted and punched. Every other one is a riveted ring to add extra strength. The Pretty Roman dense packed, it's not as many spaces between it. No. Roman male armour goes from 4mm to 9mm depending on who made it and what part of the empire and what time. Heavy? It's approximately 11 kilos this one, but once you're wearing it, it does mould to your body shape. Your shoulders support it and with the belt on, that's also supporting the weight now, you see. Take some weight off. Come over. Yeah, oh, right, so the belt see. supports it. The yeah. belt has to be worn tight around the waist. Right. Not like a gunslinger, see a dagger's hanging down. Moving on to the belt. It's a Kingulum Militaire, which is a military belt. This is what we think the Kingulum is. It's not really armour, it's more of a bit of bling. It's just the way fashion design evolved through the Roman military and at our period of time it's evolved into this. As I was saying, this is just bling, an involvement of the military style of belt. In later centuries to come, this gets shorter and shorter, disappears, the belt becomes much wider. Right. It's an evolution of equipment. If you can imagine the British Army 200, 300 years ago, the gear evolves and adapts to however they're going to fight or operate. Um, it's got belt plates upon it. These would either be silvered or tinned of the soldier's own choosing. He would put his own money into the belt. The belt was the mark of the soldier. Only a soldier would wear this belt. So you knew a soldier in civilian clothing. On the belt, on a fugio dagger. Secondary weapon, in case he lost his first weapon. Yeah. It's quite a nasty bit of gear, actually. I wouldn't like to have that punched into me. Yeah. Designed to do maximum damage. Various forms of scabbard are available. Mine's a very plain metal one. There are much more decorative ones that have inlay of copper and silver. Uh, moving on to the other side of the belt, because it's there, is everyone's favourite, Roman Gladius. This is a Mainz pattern Gladius, named after the fine spots where it came from, which is Mainz in Germany. That's M-A-I-N-Z. Not Mainz, but pronounced Mainz. It's a wooden base scabbard with a frame around the wood. Yep. Decorative plates again. Everything's decorative in the Roman army at this point in time. It's a short stabbing weapon. It's not stabbing only. It's a wasted blade, very pointed. Sorry, wasted, what do you mean? It's, wait, it's got a waste in it. Uh, pins. Wide, slightly. wide, and it wastes in. Why? 
Just you can pull it out, so in case you. No, it's just it's just the style of sword that it is. Oh, okay. It evolved from an Iberian, that's a Spanish sword from the second century BC, right, that okay. was longer. Okay. At this time, male armor is the only armor that's worn by anyone. Hence, why it has such an abrupt, sharp point. It was designed for piercing male armor. I would go for it. If you're good enough, yeah, and if you've got enough impetus behind it. Hence, why the rings were very small. Right, I see. Wouldn't stop an arrow, but would stop that. It would stop any slashing of this armour. You won't get through it. But that's the the Mainz pattern gladius, in use from possibly 50, 80 to 50 BC through to the turn of the first century AD. Moving on up, I've got a scarf on. It's not to keep warm. Is to stop my neck being rubbed by the edge of the hamata because yeah. it's not leather lined, mm -hmm. not leather trim around the edge. It also, when you've got your helmet on, prevents the neck cord rubbing against your neck and up with big red marks down here, or else from the leather thonging. <laughs> Moving on to the helmet. <laughs> the Roman military used several types of helmet, but they're all based upon a, mainly a Gallic style, i.e., Gaul from roughly the first century BC. The Romans, when they found something that was good and it worked, they adopted it and they worked on it to make it a better item. This style of helmet, it has cheek plates, protect the cheeks, mm -hmm. broad neck guard to protect any downward slashing. The back here. It has a brow band. Again, to prevent a sword going in the soldier's eyes. It helps deflect any downward blows. Yeah. With what they call eyebrows on them. That's just a crumple zone. Again, it's actually got a function then? Yeah. Oh, right. That will crumple rather than just blow in and crush. They all come with crest mounts. Yeah. All existing finds have crest mounts. No crest has ever been found though. Not complete. Mm -hmm. found, um, parts of crests have been found. This is our interpretation of the crest. The crest wouldn't be worn in battle, not by a normal soldier. It would only be worn in parade. Parades being the Emperor's birthday, the birthday of the Legion, or any mm. other high status um, datage that the, um, the commander of the Legion would decide we're having a parade. You can't fight in them, they're impractical. They wobble oh, around. Right, Soon in other armies then, did other armies have parade equipment that they um, bring it? Possibly, possibly. The main reason you wouldn't fight in it, someone grab hold of that and pull, pull it, it off, yeah. yeah. That's it, you're going down. Cheek pieces are lined up, because obviously you don't want metal being bashed against your cheekbones. Yep. They break easy. I'm wearing a, what they call a Phrygian archer cap. Because there's very few linings been found in the helmets, we presume they were using some sort of hat as a helmet liner. Because as you can see, you would just get the bare shell, and obviously you've got the edge of all the rivets poking through. So once the helmet is on, you then have to lace it up. This is where your scarf comes in again, to prevent neck rub. Yeah. You use the scarf again. So it's, it's now protecting neck rub from the thonging of the helmet and the chafing of the armour against your neck. Mm -hmm. Simple bow to time underneath. It's a three piece or three point fitment. One from under the neck or under the band there, across, through the two loops and the chin, tied together. Now that's that's pretty secure. Yeah, pretty good. Now you can see why the cheek plates, how much protection it does give you. You've got cutouts for the ears, so you can still hear what's going on. Your vision is not impaired at all by wearing this helmet. You can still see it as good as without it. Moving on to the next item. Roman scutum shield. This is based on a type found at Curleon in Wales. Slightly different from everyone's archetypal image of a Roman shield, which is square. There's one over there. Yeah. 
seems to sa saves the same purpose is made of three ply plywood stuck together with not very efficient Roman glue as metal banding around the edge to protect the shield from a split from splitting right, okay. that's where it's vulnerable a boss in the middle that protects your hand as it's a horizontal grip item that is the boss in there yes horizontal grip the boss can also be used as a weapon the whole shield can be used as a weapon I'll show you in a moment uh, various metal decorations on the shields we know these existed they're popping up left right and center in the archaeological evidence at the moment the square ones some are just decorative some are integral to the shield these square ones at the top do match up with your corner pieces of where your reinforcement plywood is weight approximately three kilo can be used as a weapon for punching if someone's running towards you just lift the thing up they're going to run into the edge of it there's not a lot of man as well when you're holding the shield up, there's not a lot of man that's visible that you can actually attack, is there? You've got the legs, and that's it. I mean, the legs is least for this thing to work out. Used in conjunction with the Gladius, yeah. it's such a large shield as well, I can hold the sword back. You don't know where that sword's coming from if I'm fighting you, whether it's going to come over the top or come in the side. I'm going to go down with the raised sharp edges for your tendons on your leg. You just don't know where it's going to come from. And last but not least, peel them. Cap up the shield there. It's a throwing javelin. It's not a spear. A spear you fight with. This is ro um, a throwing javelin. Wooden construction. Large point for penetrating anything it can. A long shank. I'll show you why it's got such a long shank in a moment. And it's fitted by three rivets on a tang into a wooden wooden holder. When thrown you'd have a volley of maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred of these all thrown at once. It's a close quarter weapon, 20 to 30 meters maximum. The idea being if you can bring down the first few ranks and stall the enemy's assault upon you, you've then got time to draw your sword and run at the enemy, as the Romans would do. This is like a machine gun in the first few ranks, like in the First World War. They go down, and then there's bodies in the way, there's mayhem and everything. The long shank, this is thrown at you. And you're Mr. Enemy, and you think, I'll stick my shield up. Don't work like that. So it goes all the way through the shield up to the wood. You've still got to have a shield at arm length. That's still penetrate, that's still going to hit me. Yeah. <laughs> also, the actual shank was made of a softer iron than the tip, tip being hardened to penetrate, soft in the middle, so that if it did come into contact and hit anything, it would bend. It cannot be then thrown back at you. In case it didn't bend, the three metal pins in here, we think some of them might have been wood. Once it hits something, it snaps the rivets, then that will just pivot. It will pivot down like that. You still can't throw it back but it's not a, an exceptionally difficult job for the armourer then to just collect these after the battle, knock them straight with an hammer and put three new rivets in it. You've got one peel and ready to go again. Each soldier would have carried two of them. Now the Greeks had a tip on the end for finishing people. Oh no, it's a frame one, of course. No, it's all right. Yeah. yeah. This has got a butt spike. Right. But it's mainly for doing that. Yeah. So right, because yeah, right. the Greeks were saying they, they needed to hold on to theirs, but yours is a frame. Yeah, right. this, is, this is a disposable item, so same as an arrow, it's a big arrow if you imagine that. <laughs> Obviously they wouldn't have been left behind. At the end of a battle you're going to gather up anything you can that's of any use to you and your own equipment again. Yeah. You know, nothing's wasted, which is why you find very little <laughs> on um, olden battlefields. Have you heard of the um, Kalkreis disaster? Three legions got wiped out in Germany in the oh, Tudorberg yeah. forest. Oh, Tudorberg, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, uh, the Germans there, they were so efficient at clearing the battlefield 
There's 15, 20, 25,000 men killed there. So there's virtually no fines left. They left the bodies, but they obviously took with them what they could for trophies. You'd think somewhere like that, it would be like Normandy beaches, you know, you go over there with a metal detector and there's just metal everywhere, isn't there? You'd think the forest would be the same, but it's not, it's just, it's devoid of fines. Oh, shame. <laughs> Is there any kit that you won't carry that's not been mentioned, like different types of swords or anything like that? Or um, spears or even your own utensils that you take with you, like, like a back, you've got You've got a marching pack, we haven't got a complete one here. That's the closest you've got to one. Right. You imagine Dick Whittington's stick with a couple of leather bags and a net in sack. So he carry what? What do our own soldier carry on the march? Most of his, in his stuff, isn't it? In his pack, he'd have, um, he'd have a sagum, which is the equivalent of a big blanket, but that can also double up his uh, cape, a cloak. Um, possibly pet spare leggings like these, some spare foot wraps, maybe a spare tunic. Um, he'd be carrying, or what he's wearing, would be the majority of the clothing he's taking. He would carry a small cooking pot, an eating pot, um, his own personal stuff, a small fire striking kit, um, maybe a cup. Imagine you're going camping and the bits and pieces you need, you know, a small knife, that sort of stuff. He'd be carrying that. Would you carry a pick or something for digging? Yeah, so I have stories that every time they um, camped you have, overnight. You have got entrenching tools of various descriptions. Depending on what job you were doing, what campaign you were doing, would depict uh, the ones that you're taking. You've got a turf cutter. Yeah, I've come over here. Turf cutter for cutting turf. Very, very, very similar to what you buy at B&Q nowadays. Just I think these personally are a little bit too long. They should be more flattened off, possibly at that sort of angle. You just can't get your foot on it. Why would you want to cut turf? Romans cut turf for fortifications. Everything was turf lined. Oh, to stop it rainwashing it. Stop all the soil oh, coming right. down. Mm. Um, this is the best beastie. You'd have definitely carried one of these as an entrenching tool. Yeah. It's very similar to a mattock. That pick end, you've got that stuff, one. Yeah. And when digging, they rarely use shovels, even though shovels are, are available. Because this thing just digs out clods. And you pull out a clod, you then use your basket to put the clods in the basket. Because then it's digging it all loose and then shoveling it up. Pointless exercise. You've got a Delabra, which is a small axe. These came in various sizes, so that's the general style of them. Again, like a pick on one end and axe end on the other. What? Trees, roots, you can still cut into the, um, cut into the turf. Multi usage, really. Yeah. Each man would carry one item of those. 